Thank you. It is now time for oral questions, and I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's Loyal House. Good morning, Speaker, and this question is for the Premier. Six months ago, the Ontario Science Centre was a world-class institution. It was bustling with school field trips, with science experiments and creative installations. But today, under this government, it's been boarded up. It's been relocated in scraps to a strip mall in Etobicoke. Just a year ago, Ontario Place was an accessible public park. It was being enjoyed by millions of visitors. But today, it's a pile of rubble locked away behind fences. I've been all over this province and no one is telling us this is what they need. So my question to the Premier is, when will he stop the schemes and the scandals and get to work building the homes, hiring the doctors and fixing our schools? To reply for the government, the Minister of Infrastructure. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and uh, to the Leader of the Opposition. It's nice to see you disrespect the Integrity Commissioner once again in this House. But, Mr. Speaker, the Science Centre Board has made a decision in order to open exhibits across the province, and two of the locations are Harbourfront Centre and Sherway Gardens. Now, we are making a big effort, the province of Ontario, in collaboration with the Science Centre, to bring Science Centre learning to the people of Ontario. This was a decision by the Science Centre, and we encourage families to go visit the exhibits um, as they do uh, and prepare for their Christmas shopping and holiday season. Thank you. A supplementary question. Well, Speaker, if the Minister can't answer on her own file because she's under investigation, maybe she can find another Minister to help her answer these questions. Uh, you know, it's been six long years of this government and Ontarians are without a doubt worse off. They are stuck trying to find a doctor. They are stuck looking for an affordable place to live. They are stuck with the bill for this Premier's costly schemes and scandals. The Ontario Order. Place scheme alone could cost taxpayers billions all so that the insiders at Thurba can make huge profits off of prime waterfront land. So my question to the Premier again is, how can this Premier or anyone else on that side possibly justify this? Members will please take their seats. Swan, the Minister of Infrastructure. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I case I don't have my facts correct, but it was the NDP and the leader of the official opposition that filed a complaint with the Integrity Commissioner. The Integrity Commissioner is doing his job. I assume that all of us who sit in the House respect the Integrity Commissioner, the institution, his office and staff. So I have to ask the question, why do you insist on disrespecting the Integrity Commissioner and the important work that he has, has to do? While you do that, the members on this side of the House will focus on building Ontario. In fact, let's just list a few accomplishments. Grandview Children's Treatment Centre, Mount Sinai, Michael Guerin Hospital, West Park Healthcare Centre, Ontario Court of Justice, all projects that reach substantial completion under this government's leadership. Remind the members to make their comments through the chair. The final supplementary. I'll say it again, uh, Speaker. Boy, do I wish we didn't have to spend all our time uh, submitting complaints to the Integrity Commissioner about this government. But sadly, that is the state of the province of Ontario right now. Yesterday, the Premier stood here and said Ontario Place was a field of weeds. The last time he said that, you know what he was talking about, Speaker? He was talking about the Green Belt. How'd that work out for you? The Premier said that, we'll recall, to justify selling off the Green Belt for $8 billion in windfall profits to their insider friends until we forced him to back down. When is this government going to learn? What is it going to take for them to reverse their latest scheme to sell off Ontario Place, or is it going to take another RCMP investigation? Members, please take their seats. 
Minister of Infrastructure. Thank you very much. And please let the Leader of the Official Opposition continue to disrespect the Integrity Commissioner in this House. I am sure he is watching. But, Mr. Speaker, let me talk about the things that keep the Order. Ministry of Infrastructure busy, that keep all of us busy, in fact. Mr. Speaker, let me talk about the projects that we are building in the province of Ontario. One Door for Care Children's Hospital in Ottawa, Mr. Speaker. The Eglinton Crosstown West Extension, Mr. Speaker. Order. Tunneling work is completed. Position come to order. The Scarborough Subway Extension, Mr. Speaker. Cambridge Memorial Hospital, Mr. Speaker. Center for Addiction and Mental Health Redevelopment Project. Go Expansion, Mr. Speaker. Highway 3, Hamilton Health Science, West Lincoln. Niagara Health, New South Niagara Hospital Project. The Ontario Line, QEW, Credit River. Mr. Speaker, we're busy building this province. The NDP is just oh. filing complaints. Thank you. Order. Order. The next question, the Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, I'm going to go back to the Premier. Uh, let's talk about another unpopular scheme of this government, the Premier's fantasy tunnel under the 401. <laughs> Recent polling is now showing that about two-thirds of the government's own voters say they strongly oppose this tunnel plan. It's even less popular, not surprisingly, with the rest of Ontarians. People in rural Ontario they don't want to hear their government is spending $100 billion in taxpayer dollars on another wacky scheme from this Premier, right? They deserve, instead, a government that's going to make sure they have access to their local emergency room, say, when they need it. So my question to the Premier is, why do this government's priorities never seem to match the reality of this province? To reply, the Minister of Transportation. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we know gridlock is an all-time high, and that's because the previous Liberal government, obviously the NDP, has Order. refused to build in this province. In 15 years, they had, some, uh, they had a chance to do something. They did absolutely nothing. They built a we look at all there. solutions to these problems, whether it's public transportation, when it's a tunnel. We know the 401 is one of the most congested areas on, uh, in the province. We need to improve productivity. We need to get people moving. And, Mr. Speaker, we will look at every option possible. We're building the Ontario Line. Moving 400,000 people every single day. That party opposed it. We're building the Highway 413, the Bradford Bypass. And we will continue to do a feasibility study on the tunnel because we know we need to look at the next 10, 20, 50 years of this province, not go back to the, 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 the previous Liberal government that did absolutely nothing to build. Response. And I can say the NDP would be no different. Here, 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 here. Supplementary question. Uh, well, Speaker, I don't think Ontarians are going to buy that from a Minister of Transportation who can't even give us an opening date for the Eglinton LRT. My gosh, a basic, basic responsibility of this minister. Um, my question back to the Premier. This is a government that is six years in, and congestion is, yes, worse than it has ever been. The Premier could get people moving today by allowing trucks to drive toll-free on the 407 and free up the 401. When we, when we put that to the government as a proposal, what did they do, Speaker? They said no. They said no to the people of this province. So why is the Premier making commuters wait for some fantasy Question. tunnel that will never get built instead of just taking back the 407? Members will please take their seat. Minister of Transportation. Mr. Speaker, that question from the NDP sums up everything you need to know about them and the previous Liberal government. They don't think anything can be built. They think everything's a fantasy. In fact, that's what they said when we, put, we, will, when we proposed the Ontario line. They said that could never get built. You could never get shovels in the ground. Guess what? The shovels are in the ground, and they will move 400,000 people every single day. That is what they said to the people of Scarborough for 10, 15 years. They denied them the subway. They denied them transit. What did this Premier do? We got shovels in the ground on the Scarborough subway extension because to them it's always a fantasy. To our government, it's about building. It's about building for the future. It's about building, putting shovels in the ground on the 413, the Bradford Bypass. This is about the future generations of this province. This isn't about the next four years. It's about thinking ahead, the next 10, 20, 50 years. 
What will this province response? need? If it was up to the NDP and Liberal, nothing would ever get built in this province. The final supplementary. I, uh, thank you, Speaker. I do seem to remember these are the same folks who poured cement down a subway line, but anyways. Uh, listen, while Ontarians are stuck waiting to find a home, a doctor, support for their kids in schools, this government is stuck in scandals and schemes that are moving us absolutely nowhere. A $1 billion spa deal. An $8 billion Greenbelt giveaway. A $100 billion fantasy tunnel. Instead of homes, Ontarians get headaches. Instead of doctors, they get delays. And instead of schools, they get spas. So my question to the Premier is, when will this government stop catering to their insiders, put people first, and finally deliver basics for Ontario? Minister of Transportation. Mr. Speaker, we are delivering every single day for the people of this province. Whether it's a $70 billion plan to build public transit, to move people faster, to meet, be, uh, make people more productive, to get people within walking distance of public transit, guess what? The NDP oppose that every step of the way. We have a piece of legislation that is on the floor that we ask the NDP and Liberals to support that would help us accelerate the construction of highway builds across this province, including the Bradford Bypass, including the Highway 413 and the Garden City Skybridge, Mr. Speaker. But guess what? I, I know what the members opposite will do. They're going to vote against it again because they don't believe in building this province. They don't believe in getting people to, to work and back to their families instead of standing, uh, spending time in gridlock. Uh, this government has a plan to build, and we will continue to make sure we get shovels in the ground, regardless of what the opposition do to try and stop here, this. Here, here, here. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Parkdale, High Park. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Education. This summer, the Conservative government cancelled already approved plans to build 48 new school-based childcare centres that would have created spaces for over 3,000 kids in the GTA. These were ready-to-go projects that were held up because of a lack of provincial funding, despite promises to fund them. Parents are desperate to get their kids into $10 a day childcare program. When the space isn't there, what are they supposed to do, especially moms? Not go to work? not pay the bills? All families deserve accessible and affordable childcare. Why are Conservatives withholding funds for much-needed affordable childcare spaces? The reply. The Minister of Education. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I think the member knows that these seats have actually been reallocated because the, the board was sitting on, on the, uh, the surplus money. But we have, we're working collaboratively Order. with the federal government to get a better deal for the Ontario families because we know that child care has increased to some of the highest costs in Canada under the former Ontario Liberal government. To be clear, from day one, we were skeptical about the deal, which is why we were the only province in Canada to secure a midway review to ensure the sustainability and longevity of this program. Having met with Minister Sides in Ottawa, I thought that we both agreed that we wanted affordable and flexible childcare for Ontario families. However, Minister Sides' response to my letter has made it clear to me that the federal Liberals care more about pushing their ideology than making childcare affordable for families in this province. I am calling on the NDPs Spons? and the Liberals across the aisle to join us to support this program to ensure that we can have affordable and flexible child care for families in this province. Thank you. Supplementary question. Speaker, the minister knows very well that funds are being withheld for child care spaces and the Conservatives are well behind and will fail to meet their own targets. Today is Child Care Worker and Early Childhood Educator Appreciation Day, and one of the things that is missing in the new funding formula and what child care workers have been asking for years is a wage grid. Other provinces have successfully implemented a wage grid. Do Ontario's child care workers and early childhood educators not deserve the same? Members, please take your seats. Minister of Education. Well, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the early childhood uh, educators for
the, the loving environment they do for our, our young folks and for those early learners. But Mr. Speaker, that is why retention and recruitment of a high quality childcare early years workforce is critical to the sustainability uh, and implementation of CWELC system and will uh, achieve the system growth and ensure increased access to high quality licensed childcare in Ontario. I have had the opportunity to visit childcare centres across this province this summer and have met with those early early childhood educators and have heard the concerns about retention and re, uh, recruitment and that's why we have made these changes and we will ensure that we are providing that's what we are doing we are providing the supports for those families Order. for 2024 the wage floor increased from the planned $20 per hour to 23.86 per hour Response. for eligible RECEs program staff from the planned $22 per hour to 24.86 per hour for the registered ECEs supervisors and RCE home care child care visitors Thank you. The next question, the member for Mississauga Malton. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Transportation. Traffic congestion costs over $11 billion in productivity losses every year. With growing population and increasing traffic congestion, it is clear we need to enhance our tra transportation infrastructure and we need to do it now. We all know the frustration of sitting in traffic, watching our time slip away due to ongoing road congestion, delays when it comes to completing vital highway projects. Time we can spend with family, friends, and loved ones. Uh, thank you to the minister. Our government has introduced Building Highways Faster Act to streamline the approval process and reduce delays. With major projects still facing years of planning and approval, it is important for the people of Ontario to see the real progress. These are important goals. We need to understand how this will actually play out on the ground. So to the Minister of Transportation, can you elaborate how this proposed Question. legislature will cut down the time it takes to build the highways? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Parliamentary Assistant the Minister of Transportation, Member for Hastings, Lennox and Edmonton. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and my thanks to my friend, uh, the member from Mississauga Malton, for, for the question. The Building Highways Faster Act is a key initiative that reinforces our government's commitment to get Ontario moving. As our population has grown, so have the pressures on our highways. But, Mr. Speaker, this legislation will allow us to cut through the delays by streamlining the approval processes and eliminating the red tape so that, we can, so that we can deliver key projects even more efficiently. It's about getting it done, building the highways we need, reducing the congestion, improving road safety, and driving economic growth by ensuring that the, gov that the movement of people and goods across this province continues to flow. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Pierre, for that wonderful answer. The need for faster and more efficient highway construction has never been more pressing for the resident of Mississauga Malton and our province. Our roads face increasing demands due to population growth and economic prosperity. Urgent action is needed and needed now, as Ontario continues to be the economic powerhouse of Canada by streamlining approval process, reducing hurdles, the government claims to be prioritizing the timely delivery of critical infrastructure projects. With that in mind, Speaker, can the parliamentary assistant please provide specific examples how the Building Highway Faster Act will expedite the construction of highways and benefit Ontario's as we progress or Ontario's going forward? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Parliamentary assistant. Once again, thank you, to, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to my friend from Mississauga Malton. Speaker, the Building Highways Faster Act will have a direct and positive impact on the daily lives of Ontarians. By reducing the time it takes to plan and build our highways, we're making sure that commuters will spend less time stuck in traffic and more time at home with families and loved ones. Improved highway infrastructure means faster, safer travel for everyone. Right? Whether it's getting to work, to school, to en or just to, to enjoy the beautiful places all across Ontario that we have to offer. Speaker, by enhancing the efficiency of our transportation system, we're also supporting local businesses, allowing goods and services to move more quickly and reliably. This government is about delivering results for Ontarians, faster commutes, safer roads, and a more connected province. 
Thank you, Speaker. The next question, the member for Toronto St. Paul's. Thank you, Speaker. To the Premier, across Ontario, people are paying enormous parking fees at hospitals. In the GTA alone, a monthly parking pass is about $400. That's a lot of money, especially for our overworked and underpaid health care workers. Earlier this week, I tabled a motion calling on this government to eliminate hospital parking fees for health care workers, hospital staff, patients and their families, and adequately fund our public hospitals. Patients should be able to bank on this government to properly fund our public hospitals and not revenue from a parking spot for the hospital care and services they need. My question is to the Premier. Will this government provide necessary funding to eliminate hospital parking fees today so health care workers, patients and families can have one less financial burden at the hospital tomorrow? Thank you. Parliamentary Assistant, Member for Essex. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The hospital parking directive is a directive that exists in the province of Ontario, and the purpose of the Ontario hospital parking directive is to keep the financial costs down on parking fees for patients and the visitors at hospitals. The directive was created to reduce the barriers to accessing health care. Mr. Speaker, under the Ontario Hospital Parking Directive, there is a cap placed on any increases for parking fees in parking spaces associated with hospitals. In addition to that, there are also special rates created for a 10-day pass or a 30-day pass. This is all in keeping with our policy to help keep the financial burden of parking down for patients Response. and for people visiting patients at hospitals in Ontario. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. I wonder if the, uh, the Premier or any MPPs pay for parking here at Queen's Park. Anyhow, back to the Premier. CTV News recently reported on a Toronto woman who paid nearly $2,000 in parking fees to visit her mother. Speaker, when you're sick, when, when you've got a loved one who is sick in the hospital, parking costs should never be a barrier. When you're getting chemo, managing chronic health conditions, or just trying to keep up with all of your medical appointments, some of us know that really well, parking costs should never ever be a barrier. As the Premier pins the price tag of his foreign luxury spa on Ontarians, Many Ontarians cannot afford to visit their loved ones in hospital, literally. So I'll ask the Premier again, Premier, will you choose people over your profit schemes, properly fund our public hospitals, and eliminate hospital parking fees today as a concrete solution to actually help Ontarians Question. get by? Thank you. Members will please take their seats. Member for Essex. Thank you, Speaker. The province of Ontario has an Ontario Hospital Parking Directive. And under this directive, the goal is to help alleviate part of the financial burden on patients Order. and their families who are visiting them at the hospital. This is a policy of the province of Order. Ontario. Under this directive, Mr. Speaker, not only is there a hard cap on any parking increases, but in addition to that, there are special rates established for a 10-day parking pass and a 30-day parking pass. This is in keeping with the policy established in the province of Ontario. There are also special discounts that are offered under the hospital parking directive. Mr. Speaker, the Hospital Parking order. Directive exists to help people in the province of Ontario Opposition come alleviate to order. the financial burden of parking because Spons. we want everybody in the province of Ontario to get the health care they need at the hospitals that are available in the province. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The next question, the member for Newmarket, Aurora. Thank you, Speaker. And my question is for the Minister of Labour, Immigration, Training and Skills Development. Ontario is at a critical juncture. And who is going to build our infrastructure in my great riding of Newmarket Aurora? We have a major pipeline that's going to be built down Leslie and it's going to add to our wastewater capacity.
I have a brand new apartment building going up on Young Street that's going to provide almost 400 new homes. Wow. Speaker, it is critical that we have enough skilled workers to meet the growing housing and infrastructure demands as we build Ontario. Without enough people in the skilled trades, we know that vital projects like hospitals, schools, homes, pipelines, they won't be built and we're going to experience delays. That's why our government must do everything we can do to provide Ontarians with the opportunities to launch these well-paying and lifelong careers. Speaker, can the minister please outline Question. what steps our government has taken to ensure we have the workforce necessary to build a strong future for Ontario? Excellent. Minister of Labour, Immigration, Training and Skills Development. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you uh, to that great member for that question and an exciting wastewater project uh, to expand housing in our community. You know, we've got students here today, and this government is taking some meaningful steps to support them on their career paths. We're expanding tech classes in high school. In our latest Working for Workers bills that we spoke to in this House this morning, we're expanding the focus apprenticeship in the skilled trades so that in grade 11 and 12, you can get hours that count towards your level one CFQ. This Minister of Education is smashing down barriers and bringing back common sense changes like financial literacy to actually ensure that these youth aren't living off of government handouts and government programs and actually have the skills to stand on their own two feet and to succeed in today's ever-changing economy. We need more youth into the trades and in my supplementary I'm going to expand on even more steps we're taking to get our next generation Fox. into the skilled trades to build the homes, hospital, highways and schools this government's building. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Ontario's economy depends on a strong, skilled workforce, and it is no secret that we are facing a shortage of skilled tradespeople. In fact, estimates suggest that by 2025, one in five jobs in Ontario will be in the skilled trades. In fact, at the same time, we know our experienced tradespeople, those who have built and shaped Ontario's infrastructure, are nearing retirement. These are the workers who mentor the next generation and keep our economy moving. If we don't act now, we risk not only losing their talent, but also the opportunity to transfer the critical knowledge to younger workers. Speaker, can the minister please explain how our government is ensuring that we can attract new tradespeople Should while retaining our experienced workers to ensure that Ontario remains a leader in the skilled trades? Minister of Labour. Thank you, Speaker. Well, it's a fundamental outlet that we just want to build Ontario, but we recognize that with the two, two challenges, one, getting a generation to actually build it, but also the retiring golden generation. You know, we're not going to do it by taxing the trades as the previous Liberal government did so well. By taxing them with increasing fees, increasing exam fees, we're lowering all of that, Speaker, or outright removing fees. In fact, Speaker, we're doing common sense changes to get more women into the trades, like properly fitting PPE, ensuring we have programs that protect women, ensuring we're making investments in programs like the Skills Development Fund that have led to a 30 per cent increase in women registration into the trades. Speaker, we're building a province. The previous Liberal government, we know it because they said it, they wanted a service economy. They turned their backs on manufacturing workers, they drove jobs out at craft, Bonds. at plants in my riding. We're building a province and we're making sure we have a workforce designed to build the things that our great country needs so we're not dependent. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Niagara Falls. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Recently, we learned about medical supply shortages affecting home care patients in the province of Ontario. Mm -hmm. The shortage is so severe that appointments are being cancelled and some patients are being sent to urgent care centres, that's if they're open, and could end up in emergency departments. It's so bad that cancer patients are, have to buy supplies, their own medical supplies, from Amazon. Crazy. The province restructured home care last year and then chose 
chose to take a five-month summer break while this crisis developed. Speaker, what is this government going to do to ensure this issue is fixed for home care patients as immediately? Thank you. Member for Essex and Parliamentary Assistant. Mr. Speaker, it is absolutely unacceptable that patients do not get their medical supplies on time or as ordered. Patients must receive their medical supplies on time and as ordered. We expect everybody who needs home delivery of these supplies in the province of Ontario, we expect them to receive their supplies and we also expect that the families counting on those supplies will receive those supplies. That is why the Minister Order. has already communicated with the Chair and CAO of Home Health, uh, Ontario Health at Home and has already directed and authorized that the CAO take all means necessary, whatever Spons. means necessary, to ensure that the supplies are delivered on time and as ordered. Thank you. Supplementary question. Just to let you know, sir, it was your government that signed the contract. You're responsible for what's going on in the province of Ontario right now. My question is back to the Premier. I heard directly from frontline front staff about how this, this supply shortage has affected them. They have been serious delays in delivery. We have an independent medical supply businesses today that have been doing this work for years without problems or complaints. Nurses are frustrated and are being forced to figure out how to divide what supplies they have left. Patients are left without the services they need. Speaker, and to this government, why was this supply contract taken from independent businesses who are doing their job with no complaints, who have been doing it for years, and given to Bayshore, one of your big donors? Thank you. Dan, I'll remind the members to make their comments through the chair. Member for Essex. Mr. Speaker, I want to make this absolutely clear. Our government expects that every person in Ontario who requires delivery of medical supplies at home shall get those medical supplies at home and on time. That is why the minister has already communicated with the CAO to make sure that those supplies get delivered on time. This is a logistic issue. There is no lack of supply. This is a, logi a logistics issue, and the Order. minister has already directed that Order. these supplies be delivered on time in accordance with the orders that were made. Any person in the province of Ontario who is out of pocket as a result of having to seek an alternative source may apply for reimbursement, and in fact, Position those actions order. have already been taken. Spons. The phone number to call is 866-377-7567. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Canada, Carleton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. There are many people who struggle with math, and this Conservative government, the Premier and his Minister of Health, are no exceptions. But the math is easy, and it's frightening. Both the Ontario College of Family Physicians and the Ontario Medical Association agree that 2.5 million Ontarians do not have a family doctor. These organizations both say this number is set to increase to 4.4 million people by 2026. 11,000 people have died waiting for surgeries and diagnostics, and the number of hallway patients in Ontario has doubled. The math is heart-wrenching. While the health minister is proud of $20 million apparently invested in team-based care, Premier wants to spend a billion dollars to sell beer in corner stores, spend more than $400 million Question. on a foreign-owned spa parking, and more than $50 billion on a tunnel. When will the Premier wake up and realize that health care needs to be his priority? To reply, the Parliamentary Assistant, the Member for Essex. Mr. Speaker, the province of Ontario supplies more primary health care to more people than any other province in Canada. And in addition to that, the primary care services in the province of Ontario are provided to at least approximately 90 percent 
of all of the residents in the province of Ontario. While let me give you an example of how we're expanding primary care right in the city of Ottawa, we can talk about the Ottawa Nurse Practitioner-led clinic where an additional 6,400 spots have been created to provide primary care to people. That's an additional 6,400 patients who will get primary care right in the city of Ottawa as a result of the actions taken by this government. We've increased Response. the health care budget from $60 billion to $85 billion so that people in Ottawa can get primary care. Order. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Well, here's some ideas of what the priorities of this government should be. The families that cannot find a family doctor. I spent this summer knocking on doors in my riding, and it was the number one concern at the door. What about residents of cities like Ottawa and Belleville who have to wait up Order. to 18 hours in a hospital emergency room? What about residents of small towns in Ontario whose emergency departments had to close because of staff shortages? What about the 17,000 residents of the health minister's own riding of Dufferin Caledon without a doctor? Or the 32,000 residents of Etobicoke North who don't have a doctor? Yes, he should prioritize the 2.5 million people across this province who don't have a family doctor. And I could go on. But Question. talk is cheap, Mr. Speaker. When will this government act on what is important to Ontarians and finally make the long overdue investments that health care needs now? Member Essex. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Ontario leads the country with almost 90% of all residents connected to primary care. That's better than Quebec, that's better than British Columbia, that's better than Alberta, that's better than every other Canadian province. Order. And while the Liberals actually trained fewer doctors when Ottawa, they were in government, we're now training more doctors as a result of the programs introduced by this government. Mr. Speaker, right in my own riding, the riding of Essex, we've added an additional 1,200 spaces to the Kingsville Primary Care Centre. That's the Essex County Nurse Practitioner-led clinic where more and more nurses are being added to the province of Ontario. In Response. fact, since making government in 2018, this government has helped to train approximately 80,000 new nurses. Thank you. The next question, the member for Mississauga Lakeshore. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Associate Minister of Auto Theft and Bail Reform. The people of Ontario and families in Mississauga Lakeshore are growing concerned about the rise in car theft. Every day we hear stories of families and individuals having their vehicles stolen right from their driveway, including my own many years ago. Car thefts are disrupting and costly, leading to high insurance premiums and loss of trust in the safety of our neighbourhoods. The people of Ontario are looking to our government for solutions. They want to know what steps are being taken to stop the crime and protecting their property. Speaker, what is our government doing to address the rising issues of car thefts in Ontario and ensuring Ontarians feel safe in their own homes and their communities? Associate Minister of Auto Theft and Bail Reform. Thank you, uh, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for that question. I know the members uh, plugged in like you wouldn't believe in Mississauga Lakeshore. He gets calls every single day, uh, residents saying uh, cars are being stolen. What is this government doing about it? Well, we're doing a lot, Mr. Speaker. Uh, people of Ontario deserve to know that when they're the victims of an auto theft crime, the aggressor will be caught and held accountable for their crimes, which is the reason why we've been laser focused on this issue and why we've invested more than $130 million to purchase five new police helicopters in the GTA in Ottawa. <laughs> Believe it or not, a, muni a municipality the size of Peel, which I represent along with the member, didn't have their own helicopter. Getting a bird in the air in seconds and minutes, rather than in minutes, hours, uh, is vital for cracking down on these violent offenders, getting them quickly. It actually helps prevent uh, high-speed high -speed pursuits, which actually keeps our officers safe as well. Uh, these helicopters will be equipped with advanced Response. technology to enhance highway safety, help in reducing violent crimes. This party's taking it seriously. That member is as well. Let's keep it going. Here, here. Supplementary question. 
Speaker. Speaker, car theft in is not just a statistic. It is a personal and often traumatic experience for the victim. For many Ontarians, losing their vehicle means losing their primary means of transportation, impacting their jobs, family, and day-to-day -day lives. The financial burdens from insurance claims and replacing a stolen vehicle can be overwhelming. Given the sophisticated nature of these car theft operations, including the use of advanced technology to bypassing security systems, urgent action is needed now. Ontario needs to know that something is being done to stop this. They want to know that our government is taking their concerns seriously. Speaker, can the minister elaborate on how the recent investment in police helicopters will enhance and enforce what we are doing to protect the people of Ontario? Thank you. The Associate Minister. Thank you, Speaker. I'd like to thank the member for that response, uh, or for that question once again. Through you, Speaker, because of the Joint Air Support Unit, police services will have access to a rapid response crime fighting tool uh, that will help police. I want to make it clear these helicopters are not only about uh, tackling organized car thieves, we're using eyes in the sky to also work against human traffickers and gun smugglers. And, Speaker, I was disappointed to hear some of the opposition scoffing about the investment in helicopters when we announced it. Uh, they don't think this is a priority for them. You know, the fact is, when police officers are in that gallery, every single member of this House will stand up and applaud them for the heroes that they are. The difference is, when they leave, the PC yeah. party stays standing up for our frontline yeah. officers. Yeah. Uh, people of Ontario work hard, day in, day out. They've told us public safety is a priority for them. It is a priority for us in the PC party. We will not relent in this work. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Kiwetanong. Miigwech, uh, Speaker. Uh, hunting is uh, fundamental to the traditional ways of life. In this Kandaga First Nation, treaty rights are being violated by helicopters flying and landing on their homelands. This is happening without their consent. These choppers are scaring the moose away and disrupting the annual fall hunt. Will this government respect treaty rights and stop all activities related to the two Ring of Fire road projects until the end of the Fall moose hunt. And to reply for the government, the Minister of Mines. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, for the uh, for the question. Uh, obviously, the uh, all of the activities around the Ring of Fire roads <coughs> are being handled through the the Indigenous communities through uh, Martin Falls and Webbe. Uh, this government is committed to consultation. Consultation. We have made that very clear and to the point that the Indigenous communities are conducting the uh, consultation to, with all the communities on those roads. Okay. Thank you. Supplementary question. Uh, speaker, um, business should not happen at the cost of the ways of life of the people of Niskandaga. Will this government respect Chief Munias's request and undertake a full review of all the activities infringing upon the treaty rights that have taken place without the consent of Niskandaga First Nation. And to respond, the Minister of Mines. Sure, thank you very much for that question. Uh, as you know, and as we said very many times, this government is fully committed to the duty consult. We take this very seriously. And in relation to all the activities in the Ring of Fire, we know that the environmental assessment process is being conducted from the indigenous, through the Indigenous communities. They are handling it. They are the individuals that are, that are uh, conducting all the consultation with the 22 nations associated with the development in the Ring of Fire. This is a, this is a priority for the, uh, for the government. We take it very seriously. Well done. Thank you. The next question, the member for Don Valley North. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Speaker, constituents often raise serious concerns about loved ones who struggle with severe mental illness and addictions. When an individual lacks the insight or judgment to accept 
appropriate treatment. I believe it is up to society to advocate for them, to help them to recover and restore them to a life of stability and purpose. Speaker, families and loved ones are advocating for severely addicted and mental, mentally ill persons to be compelled into involuntary care. Speaker, my question to the Minister <laughs> is, will the Ontario government consider this type of life-saving measures? Thank you, Speaker. To respond, the Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for the question. You know, Mr. Speaker, everyone's life has meaning, and that's why our government has been focused on creating a system of care to meet people and prioritize connecting them to supports and services when they want those services. And those investments have been continuous from the very beginning when, we, when I first became minister, including annual funding for mental health and addiction supports by over $800 million through the Roadmap to Wellness and in the 2024 budget, adding an additional $396 million. We also announced an unprecedented investment of over $370 million to build 19 new best-in-class treatment facilities through the Heart Hub programs in communities across the province. Mr. Speaker, through the, these different funds and these different uh, initiatives, we've now added over 400 detox treatments and withdrawal management beds across Ontario. And the, just the very first ones have already seen more than 10,000 new unique visits. So we are. Thank you. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, the Minister, for your answer. Speaker. Unlike other jurisdictions such as BC, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba, deterioration as an alternative to harm is only partially applied in Ontario when deciding if a patient needs involuntary treatment. Speaker, when it comes to the need for treatment, bodily harm and deterioration are also considered considered differently. For example, I witnessed that one young man was not deemed as needing treatment, who then later went on to cause his father to suffer a rib fracture. Speaker, again, my question to the minister is, what actions should the government take to reduce these types of tragedies? Thank you, Speaker. The Associate Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Once again, to make it very clear, we're focused on building a system of care, building capacity to help individuals where and when they need that help so that they can access supports as quickly as possible. And we want to connect more people to treatment. That is a priority that we are focused on to ensuring that we do have all the components necessary within community to support individuals, whether it's withdrawal management, whether it's treatment beds, and then connecting them to supportive beds and giving the opportunity to reintegrate into society. This is why the Heart Hub will add to the beds with the Addiction Recovery Fund to continue building that capacity. And as I said, one of the things that we see as a fallout of that is that there's less pressure on the emergency rooms and more Response. capacity for the individuals in the community. Mr. Speaker, we're going to continue building capacity in the province and looking after the people, meeting them where and when. Thank you. Thank you. And the next question, the member for Lanark, Frontenac, Kingston. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Rural Affairs. With inflation already hurting families in my riding of Lanark, Frontenac, Kingston, the Trudeau Crombie carbon tax is making life even more unaffordable. Rising costs on Order. everyday essentials like groceries, Order. gas, and home heating are pushing hard-working Ontarians to the financial brink. Order. In rural areas where people rely on driving long distances for work and services, the added burden of higher fuel prices is already causing more economic hardship. How can carbon tax Crombie and her Liberals justify increasing taxes on food, fuel, and other necessities of life when so many are already struggling to just get by. Speaker, can the minister please share 
what our government is doing to help fight this unjust carbon tax. Minister of Rural Affairs. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And to the member from Lanark, Frontenac and Kingston, I thank him for this question because we need to continue to talk about how the Liberal ideology is continuing to cost increase the cost of living for not only individuals in the GTHA but across the province as well as the cost of doing business but it's our government under the leadership of Premier Ford and the astute mind of the Minister of Finance that we're bringing solutions to the table for instance we're helping leave more money in seniors pockets by indexing the guaranteed annual income benefit for the first time in Ontario's history, to the rate of inflation. We're, we've also extended the tuition freeze to help families and students achieve goals when it comes to pursuing their goals in terms of next jobs that we have in Ontario. The other thing I want to share is Spons. that we're embracing nuclear. We need to because we need affordable, reliable, green electricity. And we've reduced gas by 5.7 cents, and we're making sure that we in Ontario Thank you. And thank you. Supplementary question. Thank you, Minister, for that response. It is encouraging to hear about the strong leadership of the Premier and the Minister on this issue. Unfortunately, the reality of the financial situation of so many families in my riding, because of the carbon tax, is truly a challenge. The Parliamentary Budget Officer has confirmed once again that the carbon tax cost most households uh, most households bore than any, more than any would ever get back in rebates, further deepening the affordability of the crisis. Carbon tax, Gromby and the herd Liberals are expensive and out of Foreigners. touch when it comes to the understanding of the negative impact of the carbon tax on rural families. Speaker, can the Minister please share what investments our government has made to support residents in rural Ontario as we fight the Liberal carbon tax? Here. Minister of Rural Affairs. Thank you very much. You know, I, I do want to revisit the fact that it's our government that's expanding nuclear across this province here, here. so that we can have affordable electricity. And this matters why I'm looking at the young people in the gallery today and to those of you watching, you need to know that the Liberal ideology is going to more than double the cost of carbon tax across the nation. And what does that mean for us? I live on a farm in rural Ontario. We have to heat our house and run our business on propane because we don't have access to natural gas. My friend here, the Minister of Mines, who lives in Timmins, he only has access to propane as well. And ladies and gentlemen, when this carbon tax more than doubles by the year 2030, six short years from now, the cost of propane, for example, is going to go from 12.4 cents to 26.3. They are doing nothing. They, Bonnie Crombie and Justin Trudeau, based on Liberal ideology, is driving costs through the roof. It's our government in Ontario that are standing up and will fight every day. Thank you. The next question, the member for Toronto Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. ODSP rates are legislative poverty in Ontario. I speak to constituents, some of them living in government-held ridings every single month. They are barely surviving on the $1,300 per month that they receive. Rent for a studio apartment in Toronto alone is already over $1,400 a month. That leaves people with a negative cash balance at the end of the month. No wonder homelessness has doubled. We are also seeing that there is almost 27,000 people living in Ontario with ODSB and OW who are homeless. When will the Premier end legislative poverty in Ontario? When will he double the ODSP rates? The Associate Minister of Women's Social and Economic Opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I do thank the member for the question, but we have to remember where things were at when the Liberals and the NDP were here. You had an opportunity to increase the rates, but you really didn't. And in 2022, we Order. made a significant change by increasing Order. the rates at the rate of inflation. Do you, does the members opposite know where we're at right now? We've increased the rate 17%. 17%. Here, here. And we've also 
border. And people on ODSP an increased ability to earn income. We increased that rate by 400 percent. And so, Mr. Speaker, we're going to keep doing this because also through the member, uh, my colleague here, Skills Development Fund is also giving many people opportunity here, here. to get training that, right? to get the jobs in the future, Mr. Enough. Speaker. We're not going to stop working and helping those most vulnerable in Ontario. That's what we're going to do. We're going to keep working with them. Here, here, Thank here. you. Well, the supplementary question. Min uh, Speaker, thank you. I want to remind the minister that they have a responsibility now, six years in power, stop pointing the finger over there and start looking into the mirror. Speaker, we have to, we have to believe that the marriage equality exists in Ontario, but in fact, it does not. Ontarians on ODSB choose, who choose to live with their partner, their financial support is dr drastically cut. It's barely, it's almost eliminated altogether because ODSB considers their partner's meager income as their own income from the minute they move in together. Imagine delaying or foregoing living with the person that you love, your life partner, your co-parent, your caregiver. Speaker, this is such an important issue. We have so many people coming to the House who want to hear this answer. We need to ask this government, will you fix the incredibly discriminatory practice, or does he think that people on ODSB don't deserve to live with their partners, the people that they Question. love? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member opposite has to also understand that this is a process that we are fixing and we're working with all of those who are saying to us we need the support. Order. And it's happening Order. at the rate of inflation. That's why we're at 17 percent. The member opposite laughed at us when we said we are increasing it by 5 percent and at the rate of inflation. So now we're at 17 percent increase. And also we are doing things across Order. government to make life more affordable, here, here. right? The lift care tax we've been adding. We've also one fare, $1,600 here, no, no, no. so that people can get around one fare. We're also pushing back against the carbon tax because every time we make these increases to help people, we have a carbon tax that's sucking the money right Shame. back out of their Shame. pockets. Shame. Mr. Response. Speaker, Order. the members opposite support our attempts to make life more affordable here, here. in Ontario and support our initiatives? to help every single person in Ontario have an opportunity here, here, here. at financial Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Oakville North Burlington. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Education. In growing communities, the need for a new and updated school is critical. Under the former Liberal government, propped up by the NDP, families waited far too long for a single school to be built. Because of their inaction, parents and educators across our province and in communities like mine are worried about the pace of school construction. When we look at areas of rapid growth, such as Oakville North Burlington, we see a clear need to ensure that our education capital projects are moving forward swiftly and efficiently. Every student deserves a learning environment that will help them succeed. Speaker, can the minister please explain what steps our government is taking to accelerate the pace of school construction across the province and in my own community of Oakville, North Burlington? Minister of Education. Hardworking member from Oakville, North Burlington, for the question. Under our $1.3 billion plan, schools are being built faster and more efficiently so that students can attend state-of-the-art schools close to home and in their local communities. And since September of 2023, 29 new school construction projects have opened. One of these was a new St. Cecilia Catholic Elementary School in the member's riding. Speaker, I had the pleasure of touring this new school with the member and met with, met with Mrs. Palzese and her students in grade eight to participate in a STEM class that focused on how energy is transferred. We then went on to tour Mrs. Brown's grade one class to participate in a literacy activity to identify initial sounds and rhythm matching. Speaker, it is tours like these that make me so proud of the work that our teachers are doing supported Response. by this government. The students and teachers at St. Cecilia were truly enjoying their new school and it was heartwarming to be able to see them in action. Beautiful. Supplementary question. 
Speaker, I'd like to thank the Minister for her recent visit to St. Cecilia Catholic School and for the response and the important work being done to support schools across our province. In my own riding of Oakville, North Burlington, our population continues to grow rapidly. Families are moving in, and with that growth, the demand for student spaces and childcare is increasing. While we've seen progress, I hear from parents who are concerned about whether schools are opening fast enough to meet this demand. And it's not just about building more schools, but about building them on time. We know that delays can have a significant impact on students, forcing them to overcrowded classrooms or longer commutes to schools in other areas. Speaker, can the minister outline how our government is investing Question. in new schools across Ontario? Here. Minister of Education. To the member, since 2018, our government has approved or supported the development of over 300 school-related projects, including childcare, of which more than 100 are actively under construction. In the member's own riding of Oakville, North Burlington, our government has supported an investment of over $208 million for five new schools and one school addition to create 4,541 student spaces and 352 childcare spaces. That includes two new elementary schools and one secondary school addition completed and opened from our investment of $51.9 million, creating 1,627 student spaces and 88 childcare spaces. And three new schools are planned or under construction from our investment of $157 million that will Response. create 2,914 student spaces and 264 childcare spaces. Our government is making historic investments to ensure students, not only in the members' riding, but across Ontario, are receiving the best education possible. Thank you very much. That concludes our question period for this morning. I beg to inform the House that, pursuant to Standing Order 9H, the clerk has received written notice from the government House Leader indicating that a temporary change in the weekly meeting schedule of the House is required, and therefore the House shall commence at 9 a.m. on Monday, October 28, 2024, for the preceding orders of the day. Going to recognize the government house leader under Standing Order 59. Yes, uh, sta under Standing Order 59, uh, we'd like to tell the house, inform the house of the schedule for next week. As you just stated, uh, Speaker, on Monday, October 28th, the house will resume at 9 a.m. and we'll continue second reading debate on Bill 212, the Reducing Gridlock, Saving You Time Act. Uh, in the afternoon, we'll be debating Opposition uh, Day Motion uh, Number One. On Tuesday, October 29th, in the morning, we will have second reading of Bill 214, the Affordable Energy Act. In the afternoon, routine proceedings, the uh, Associate Minister of Women's Social and Economic Opportunity will deliver a ministerial statement on Women's History Month. Uh, afterwards, we'll continue with second reading of Bill 212, the Reducing Gridlock, Saving You Time Act. On uh, Wednesday, October 30th, in the morning, a second reading of Bill 212, the Reducing Gridlock, Saving You Time Act. In the afternoon, routine proceedings, the Minister of Finance will introduce the fall economic statement and will deliver a ministerial statement following. In the afternoon, a second reading of Bill 214, the Affordable Energy Act, and also a private member's bill, the member for Oxford, will have private member's motion number 117. On Thursday, October 31st, in the morning and afternoon, we will debate the fall economic statement. Thank you very much. I understand the member for Toronto Centre has a point of order as well. I do, Speaker, and thank you very much and for the indulgence. Um, earlier this morning, I wanted us to acknowledge a very special young man who was in the building, um, and I want to let you know that he has actually arrived. Um, the special young man is 101 years old. His name is Sir George Ber Beardshaw, and he is Canada's last surviving British home child. He's traveled today from London, Ontario. He was a member of the Queen's own rifle infantry, and in the last 23 days of World War II, he and his fellow soldiers survived on a ration of two potatoes per day. For those who are not able to join us for the reception, please welcome Sir Beardshaw.
Thank you. Thank you very much. There being no further business this morning, this House stands in recess until 1 p.m.